Hey everybody, Dr. O here. Let's review the digestive system. Obviously a big one. So let's jump right in. First question, define anabolism and catabolism. So uh, you've probably heard the term anabolic or catabolic, but um, they're, they're kind of two sides of the same coin and they're intimately connected here with digestion. So anabolism is something that leads to growth and requires energy. It's the buildup of something. I think of anabolic steroids making someone bigger and stronger. So it's a buildup of something that requires energy. Um, catabolism is the breakdown of something that releases energy. So obviously think about food. You are what you eat, as we say, right? So when you eat food, you catabolize it. You digest your food into its building blocks, its raw materials, and release energy during the process. That's catabolic. Then once you absorb, you take in that energy and you take in those building blocks. You use those building blocks to build other things. So you have the energy from your food and the building blocks from your food are what you need to build things anabolically. So you're, you see how they're, they're both intimately connected. And that's how you take the food that you eat, the food on your plate, and turn it into your, bo your body, the proteins and fat and glycogen and everything else in your body. So that's anabolism and catabolism. Okay, understand the basic role of each key function of the digestive system. Ingestion, mechanical processing, digestion, secretion, absorption, and excretion. Now, uh, that's the long list and we'll go through them all, but I like to really break it down to three things. Digestion, absorption, elimination. So I'll come back to that. Ingestion, the decision to put something in your mouth and eat it. So you're physically taking it into your body. Mechanical processing, that's the mechanical breakdown in your food. So obviously chewing is a big, big part of that, but there's also some mechanical churning that goes on. So ingestion is, is, is starting the process by eating something. Mechanical process, the physical breakdown of something. Digestion is more the chemical breakdown of things. So you mechanically break down food to make it so you can swallow it and you do mechanically break it down in other ways too. But most digestion is a chemical process where you're actually breaking food down into its building blocks. Secretion, we secrete six, seven liters of fluid a day um, as a part of digestion, whether it's um, saliva, gastric juices, pancreatic juices, et cetera. So we have to secrete things. So we have the buffers we need to protect our GI tract and the, and the mucus we need to lubricate things and everything else. Absorption. So once you've digested your, your food materials, you can now absorb it and take it across the lining of your gut into your bloodstream. And then excretion. What we don't, what we can't digest and absorb gets passed through us. So um, that's, that's how you understand those key role terms, but if I break it down to the three, digestion, absorption, elimination. So when I do it like that, digestion is really the chemical and physical breakdown of the food we're eating. Absorption, so we've now broken it down to small enough pieces that we can absorb it. Like we shouldn't be able to absorb, you know, long carbo trains of glucose. We shouldn't be able to absorb large proteins. We break them down into their monomers, their basic building blocks, and those are what we absorb. Glucose and monoglycerides and individual amino acids. You absorb what you can, and you eliminate what you can't. That should be mainly just fiber, things that aren't digestible. All right, so that's the basic terminology we'll be speaking here in this chapter. What makes an organ an accessory digestive organ? So your digestive system is two things. It's your alimentary canal or your gastrointestinal tract. I just like to call it the GI tract. And then it's everything else. So an so we have that hollow tube that runs from your mouth to your anus. That's your GI tract. Everything else is an accessory digestive organ. Doesn't mean they're not important. They're critically important. So we have the salivary glands, the liver and gallbladder, and the pancreas would be your key accessory digestive organs. But that's why they're accessory. They're not part of that tube. Okay, remember the visceral and parietal peritoneum from chapter one. So these are one of your ventral body cavities. We have the pericardial cavity with the heart, pearl cavities with the lungs. Your peritoneal cavities are where most of your abdominal pelvic organs are. Visceral means organs, so that's the layer that's on the organ itself. Parietal means body wall, so it's the layer, the lining the cavity it's in. The reason these two layers are important is there's a watery, serous fluid between them that reduces friction when these, when these things move. So that's just a quick review of what we covered way back in our intro to anatomy. All right, so not, e not every uh, organism here, not every organ, sorry, is going, to have a, uh, the, is going to be inside this peritoneal membrane. And that brings us to the next point. What does the word retroperitoneal mean? And how are these organs or organ parts protected? So retro means behind. So retroperitoneal organs are not part, they're not inside the peritoneal cavity, they're behind it. How they're protected, they're firmly attached to the posterior abdominal wall. Best examples here would be uh, the duodenum of your small intestine, 
and the pancreas. Those are the first two I think of, but parts of the ascending and descending colon and the rectum are also retroperitoneal. So they don't need to be firmly held in place by this peritoneal cavity because they're attached to the posterior abdominal wall. All right, another thing about the, 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 these membranes, what is a mesentery and what is its function? So we talked about visceral and parietal layers. A double layer of those membranes is a mesentery. So it functions as a place where we can deliver blood vessels and lymphatic vessels so you can move material to and from them. But to me, when I think of the mesentery, I can't help but think of my phone charger and my computer charger. It, key, it holds these organs in place so they don't get all tangled up. You've got almost 30 feet of tubes running through you. And if you're, if you're anything like me, every time you go to use your cell phone charger, it's got a knot in it. So imagine if all of your abdominal pelvic contents were just stuck at the bottom of your abdomen and getting all tangled up. So it holds these things in place. It holds your small intestine where it's supposed to be, et cetera, et cetera. So it does allow for the movement of nutrients and waste products, et cetera. But that's the main thing I think of. It's a double layer of this peritoneal membrane, but its primary function is to hold your organs in place. If I took uh, as good a care of my gut, my intestines, as I did my Mac charger, for example, I would have already died from an obstructive bowel disease. All right, what is the difference between peristalsis and segmentation? So peristalsis is, to me, I mean, they're both really important, but segmentation is a churning process that takes place in one area to help uh, break things down physically. So to help mechanically break down your food. Peristalsis, think movement from one area to another. So whether is our muscles just causing a churning in the area, that's segmentation. Peristalsis is, I think of it as squeezing a tube of toothpaste. So it's moving material from one place to the next. So like when you swallow, that's peristaltic contractions that carry the food from your throat to your stomach. And then when that, when that what's now called chyme, is squeezed into your small intestine, again, peristalsis. So peristalsis, think moving from the mouth to the anus. Segmentation is a churning. All right, what is your enteric nervous system? So I just want you to know it does have 100 million neurons. There's actually as many neurons in your enteric nervous system as there is in your spinal cord. So it's a huge part of your uh, nervous system. It is the, the, the subconscious part of your nervous system that oversees digestion. It controls what are called short and long digestive reflexes, these types of things. So it's the arm of your nervous system specifically um, tasked with controlling digestion. Enteric nervous system. Okay, remember the type of epithelia that covers each part of the GI tract from the tissue chapter. What parts are stratified squamous? What parts are simple columnar? What areas are keratinized? And what area has microvilli? So a lot, a lot of questions here. So um, simply put, the beginning and end of your GI tract are stratified squamous epithelium. So your, your mouth and your throat and your esophagus are stratified squamous epithelium because they're going to be potentially damaged, so they have, you need tough tissues. Then the other end, the rectum and anus, are stratified squamous epithelium. So beginning and end of your GI tract need protecting, so they're stratified squamous epithelium. The middle of your GI tract is all about absorption and secretion, so it's going to be simple columnar. That's going to be your stomach, your small intestine, and then most of your large intestine. So that's the parts that are stratified squamous and simple columnar. What areas are keratinized? So when you keratinize stratified squamous epithelium, you make it even tougher. The roof of your mouth there is the key. You could, you could say the roof of your mouth is one of the absolute toughest tissues in your body. So that's the key area that's keratinized. Then what area has microvilli? That'd be the simple columnar cells of the stomach, small and large intestine would have microvilli. This is a review from back in the cell chapter. Microvilli increase surface area. So if you really want to absorb and secrete a lot of stuff, you use microvilli. That's why, so if you think about it, your, your, your gut is all about surface area. We need a massive surface area to digest and absorb lots and lots of food. So um, if you're, so you're like for small intestine, for example, has folds in it. And then these folds have fingers called villi on them. And then these villi have cells that have microvilli. So you have folds with fingers with microscopic fingers. Well, that's super important because if, you're, let's say if your small intestine was just a hollow tube, like a pipe, we would absorb, depending on who you ask, we would absorb between 600 and 3,000 times less food. So this massive surface area is very, very important. So that's why those microvilli do matter. Okay. <clears throat> How many pairs of salivary glands do you have? Why are they so important? And which glands produce the majority of your saliva?
So um, you have you have your three pairs of salivary glands, the parotid glands. I, I always think of them with like the mumps, um, sublingual, which means below your tongue glands, and submandibular, which are kind of deep in here in the side. So um, those are the three the three pairs of salivary glands we have. Why are they so important? Well, saliva has lots of important things in it. Um, for example, your parotid glands, they produce, they have a lot of uh, salivary amylase, which is an enzyme that breaks down carbohydrates. There is another enzyme, I think it'll be covered in a later question, uh, called lingual lipase that comes from under the tongue there. Um, your saliva has lysozymes, which help control uh, oral bacteria. There's a lot of mucus in, in your saliva and then water to help lubricate your food so you can swallow it. So saliva is very, very important. But it's primarily water, but the other ingredients do matter too. Um, which glands produce the majority of your saliva? That's the submandibular. So 70% of your saliva comes from your submandibular salivary glands, about 25% from your parotid glands, and 5% from the, the sublingual. Sublingual, not a lot of saliva, but uh, they play a pretty big role in buffering things to make sure the pH doesn't get out of whack. All right, uh, let's see. What is the primary function of the lysozyme in your saliva? I was just mentioning that. It's to control oral bacteria. So, li there, so, the lysozyme, so your spit is basically antibacterial, at least to some extent. What is the technical term for chewing? That's going to be mastication. So your, uh, we'll, come, we'll come back to your muscles of mastication in just a moment. Teeth. I don't ask a lot about teeth, but how many primary dentition or baby teeth do we have or did we have? How many permanent dentition or adult teeth do we have? So baby teeth, there, there, there are 20 of them. So my son is four, just went to the dentist, they counted his 20 teeth. Um, the other, another name you might hear for these is deciduous teeth. I, you don't hear it much anymore, but deciduous like deciduous trees, the leaves fall off. So that means these are teeth that are going to fall out. So your, your baby teeth, there are 20. Your adult teeth, your, your permanent teeth, there'll be 32 of them. All right. What are the two primary muscles of mastication? Your temporalis muscles and your masseters. So if you clench your teeth together, you feel these muscles tense up. So temporalis and masseters are the two primary muscles of mastication. You can make an argument pound for pound, the masseter is the toughest muscle we have. Pretty solid argument for that. All right, um, what are the three parts of the pharynx? So the pharynx is this shared tube between your respiratory and, and GI tract. But there are three parts. The uh, nasopharynx is the top portion. It's attached to your back of your nasal cavity. Oropharynx, oro meaning mouth. That's right behind the mouth. And then the laryngopharynx is the, is the bottom portion that's attached to your larynx. Or by the larynx there. All right, so three parts of the pharynx. What is the technical term for swallowing? So chewing is mastication. Swallowing is deglutition. There are three directions food and drink could possibly go when you swallow. Which two are closed off during swallowing and how? So when you swallow, food can go, go out. I guess, I guess I should say four because back out your mouth. But um, food could go up through your nose and out it. You've probably had food or drink shoot out your nose at some point. Uh, it can be pretty, pretty uh, difficult to deal with. Uh, the second is down the wrong pipe in, through the glottis into your trachea. And the third is where it should go, into the esophagus. So the two areas that are closed off, so when you swallow, your soft palate flips up and that should cover your internal nares, your internal nostrils, so the food and drink can't go out your nose. The epiglottis flips down and covers the glottis, the opening to your trachea. So the only other place that food and drink has to go is down your esophagus into your stomach which it should. So um, if you get startled or surprised or, or surprised or laugh while you're e eating or drinking, you know, these kind of things can happen. I remember once in, my, once in my early 20s, I shot some whiskey out my nose. That was quite painful. But, um, and then when you get older, many of you that work in healthcare know that some people, the epiglottis gets real stiff and it's not very flexible anymore. So if you've ever had any patients or clients that need thickened water, it's usually because of that. So it's, uh, water is able to sneak past the epiglottis into the, uh, into the, the trachea the airways. All right, um, what is unique about the smooth muscle of the stomach? So in almost all parts of the body, there's two layers of smooth muscle, a circular layer and a longitudinal layer. The stomach and the urinary bladder have a third layer. No, they're not, they're not the same. But so the stomach has a third oblique layer. So that's the key there. The stomach has three layers of smooth muscle instead of the typical two that you find in most other hollow organs. All right, what are the four parts of the stomach? That's going to be the cardia, or the cardiac region, the fundus, the body, and the pylorus. So the cardia or cardiac region of the stomach is the part attached to your esophagus. The fundus is the highest portion, so the stomach does have, it kind of looks like a, a big J or something. The fundus is the highest portion of the stomach. The body is the biggest part of the stomach. And the pylorus or pyloric area is what attaches to the, 
with the, at the pyloric sphincter to the duodenum, to the small intestine. So those are the th- four parts of your stomach. How can the stomach be full of a powerful acid and a protein digesting enzyme without being destroyed? So it's a great question. The stomach's made of protein and the acid in your stomach can break down protein and so can the protein digesting enzyme, which is called pepsin. So the, the, true, the true answer is your stomach shouldn't touch this, these stomach contents. There's a layer of mucus that's full of the buffer bicarbonate that actually should keep your gastric juices, your stomach juices away from the stomach. If that layer gets thin, or isn't there, that's where things like gastritis and ulcer comes from. So the true answer is it really can't. The stomach needs to be kept away from stomach contents. All right, uh, know what your parietal cells and chief cells secrete. So parietal cells, it's two answers. So the parietal cells of the stomach make the hydrochloric acid that's in your stomach that gives it the real low pH and helps us denature proteins. It also makes intrinsic factor. Pretty specific example, it's something we cover more in nutrition, but intrinsic factors needed to digest and absorb B12. So um, that's why there's, I like to use a case study where someone is having stomach issues that leads to a B12 deficiency anemia. Well, the two are related. So the parietal cells think hydrochloric acid, stomach acid, and intrinsic factor which you need to absorb B12. And then the chief cells, they make pepsinogen. So pepsinogen, the agen tells you it's like a pre-enzyme. So once pepsinogen gets into the stomach and the, the low pH changes it into pepsin, which is the protein digesting enzyme in your stomach. All right, when does digestion truly begin? Excuse me, I'm in a position. Called the cephalic phase. It's when we think about food. Smell food, see food, think about food. So the cephalic, which is another name for your head, the cephalic phase of digestion means that when you start to think about food, the digestion will actually begin. Your mouth will water, your enzymes might kick into high gear. I saw one strange study a few years ago that showed that even dreaming about food was causing people's insulin levels to change and things like that. So, so it actually begins when you think about food. What are the three parts of the small intestine and what is the key feature about each part? So the, the small intestine is one long tube where you could, you could say 80 to 90% of all digestion absorption takes place there. It's broken into three parts, the duodenum, the jejunum. This is how I say it. You know, other people say duodenum and different things. The duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. So the duodenum, I call the mixing bowl. Just the first 10, 12 inches, it's where the chyme, that syrupy acid mixture from the stomach, is dumped and mixed with bicarbonate from the pancreas, which is a buffer that neutralizes the acidity, um, the digestive enzymes from the pancreas, and bile from the liver and gallbladder. So I call it the mixing bowl. These, these four ingredients are ch- mixed together. Um, next, we have the jejunum. This is, the, this is where most digestion absorption takes place. So the jejunum is where we, we actually do break down and absorb most of our food. Uh, the last area, the ileum, it's kind of famous for being the longest part of the small intestine, but really most digestion absorption should already be t- have taken place by here. Um, the ileum is where you're going to find the pyres patches, which are which we, we covered in another, another section. They're an example of malt mucosa associated lymphoid tissues, so a lot of immune activity going on there. Um, to me, the big thing with the ileum is you'll see a lot of B12 absorption here, but mainly a lot of bile reabsorption will happen here as well. So the ileum really just kind of famous for being the longest part. The duodenum and jejunum do most of the work. Okay, what are the endocrine functions of the pancreas? What are the exocrine functions of the pancreas? So endocrine glands are going to dump secretions into body fluids, into your bloodstream. Exocrine glands are going to dump secretions through ducts, just to review, onto surfaces. So when we think of the pancreas, we generally think of insulin, but uh, only 1% of the pancreas is, is endocrine. So only 1% of the pancreas makes hormones. And it's not just insulin, it's insulin and glucagon. We covered that in the endocrine system. The exocrine functions of the pancreas, the other 99%, makes two main things, two main classes of things. Buffers. Bicarbonate being the most important buffer to neutralize the acidity of that chyme, C-H-Y-M-E, um, leaving the stomach and entering the small intestine. And then we have your digestive enzymes. So you've got pancreatic amylase, which breaks down carbs. Amylose means carbs. You have your pancreatic lipases, which break down fats. And you have the group of enzymes that break down proteins called the proteases. So 99% of the pancreas is digestive. It's, it's neutralizing the acidity from the stomach and it's breaking down your food. All right, what are the four lobes of the liver? So we have the left lobe, the right lobe, the caudate lobe, and the quadrate lobe. They're not all the same size, but you you just have to know there's four lobes. What's a liver cell called? It's called a hepatocyte. 
what are the functional units of the liver called? So it's not hepatocytes. It's actually what's called a liver lobule. The average lobe of the liver has about 100,000 of these lobules. They're called a functional unit. So if I were to look at maybe a structural unit of most of the liver, I would call it, say, hepatocyte. But the functional unit of the liver is it called a liver lobule. What is the function of bile? Where is it made and where is it stored? So bile emulsifies fats. Really important to note here, bile does not digest fat. Bile makes fat digestible. So emulsification is when you take, because oil and water don't mix, bile basically makes lipids, your fats, temporarily water-soluble so they can be carried. They can be, they can be broken down and they, so they turn like one huge fat glob or droplet into thousands of tiny ones and that greatly increases the surface area so that pancreatic lipase can do its job, can chew up and digest that fat. So bile emulsifies fat, doesn't digest it. And if you want, so what it is, emulsification is the same thing to do when you use soap. You can't just run water on your body because there's too many oils on your body. So soap allows you to rinse away oils, um, just like bile emulsifies fats in your gut. So where is it made and where is it stored? So when we think of bile, we think of the gallbladder, and that's where it's stored. But the liver makes it. So it's made in the liver, stored in the gallbladder. All right. We cannot cover every one of the hundreds of things the liver does, but what are the three categories of functions that it does it does perform? So it, depending on the class, we cover the liver from different angles, right? Depending on whether it's nutrition or anatomy or whatever. But uh, the liver, yeah, does hundreds of functions at any one time. So it's three major classes. The simplest one is bile production. So the liver makes the bile that is stored and concentrated in your gallbladder. So if you don't have a gallbladder, you still have bile, but it's not stored in large quantities. So if you've ever had your gallbladder removed, eat too much fat, you're probably going to pay the price, especially until your body gets used to it. And it's also not going to be um, as concentrated because as bile sits in the gallbladder, it gets dehydrated. So there's more bile and less water. So that's the, the easiest thing to understand about the liver. It makes bile. But then we have metabolic regulation and hematological regulation. So it plays a big role in your metabolism and the health of your blood. Metabolic regulation, I mean, it decides um, it, it can make fats and it, and it decides whether um, carbohydrates should be used or stored as glycogen. It stores glycogen in the liver or should it, um, it be turned into fat, these kind of things. So your, your, your liver can actually take carbs and turn them into fat. It's called de novo lipogenesis. Your liver can also do something called gluconeogenesis, where it can take non-carbohydrates and turn them into sugar. So you see, they play, it plays a major role in your metabolism. Um, hematological regulation, so it's going to play a big role in cleaning up old red blood cells. It makes your plasma proteins. It um, stores a lot of nutrients. If there's too much of something in your, in your blood, your liver will take some of it, those types of things. So again, we could do a whole semester just on the liver, but those are the three main categories of liver functions. What are the two primary functions of the large intestine? So most digestion and absorption have already taken place. So the large intestine is going to be the reabsorption of water and the temporary storage of feces. So of course, some nutrients, some vitamins are going to be made and absorbed in the large intestines. They're not the only functions, but it's two primary functions. Reabsorb water or else you would always have diarrhea, which would be a serious problem. Diarrhea still kills two to four million humans a year. Uh, and, then the, and then the temporary storage of feces until you defecate. Let's see, what are the pouches of the colon called? Those are called haustra, H-A-U-S-T-R-A. The, the, the large intestine is a much larger opening, kind of a lot more loose um, structure than the small intestine does. Let's see. Um, what is the key vitamin produced by the bacteria in the large intestine? That would be vitamin K. So we get probably get half of our vitamin K from our gut bacteria every day. That's why when a baby's born, they give them a vitamin K injection because they don't have their own microbiome yet. They're not making vitamin K. I cannot say for sure that's true though, because there is some research that shows that while it's true, vitamin K is being made there, most of it is not being absorbed. But I don't know, but that's the answer at this point. It's vitamin K. And then understand the defecation reflex. So I consider it positive feedback. It's a, it's a weak example, but you know, like you could go, to the, you could go, you could defecate, you should defecate, you like have to defecate, right? So it gets stronger and stronger, the stimulus. But defecation and, and micturition, which is urination, are both pretty similar. You need to um, relax the, the smooth muscle sphincters and the skeletal muscle sphincters in order to defecate or urinate. The key difference is you really don't have to relax to defecate. With defecation, you just have to increase abdominal pressure. So if you if you strain at the stool and increase abdominal pressure, then you should defecate. With urination, you really do have to kind of 
get these um, the smooth muscles to relax. So you increase abdominal pressure and that's going to um, start the defecation reflex and you should defecate unless you're constipated and you have, you know, hard, dry, difficult to pass stool. This this should work pretty smoothly. So, all right, I think that's everything. I wish, uh, only thing I will add here that it's not on the list, I, I should have as a question on here, is the parts of the large intestine. So we do have uh, uh, the cecum. So the cecum is the pouch that receives the content from your small intestine. There's a valve called the ileocecal valve there. Then it goes from the cecum, which is where the appendix is. The appendix is actually attached to the cecum. Then we have the ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, sigmoid or S-shaped colon, rectum and anus. So I should have put the parts of the small intestine on there somewhere. So, okay. Um, crush it. Be blessed.